Uh, I'm Braden Coetz. I work over in Google Ventures. And a couple months ago, I started working with a lot of the startups that we work with. And they're all interested in game design. And so I thought, oh, crap, I need to learn about this. And I went on the web, and I looked at all the stuff that was out there in game design. And there was just tons of noise. Eventually, I ran across some slide decks that Sebastian Dieterding had posted. And they were just amazing. I was impressed with both the depth of stuff that he worked, looked at, all the different techniques for gamification, and the depth. He really understood why these techniques were working and when to apply them in different contexts. So I'm very pleased to have him here at Google today. He uh, is in town just for a little bit. Uh, he uh, currently is a UX designer and a researcher, which is a nice nice combination to have. He's working on his PhD and studies persuasive design and bringing game design principles into different contexts. So please join me in welcoming Sebastian Dieterding. So hi, everyone, and um, thanks for having me. And yeah, just as, as Braden said, I try to spread myself a little through the world. Usually, if people need somebody who play the contrarian, then they ask for a grumpy German scholar, which I am, to sort of play the opposite to the enthused venture capitalist or the, the enthused startup. Um, so that is usually um, my role. And at one of these events, actually last year in London at Playful, a friend of mine said, well, all of your critiques and your ideas, they're all nice and fine, but is there actually anything that you do like? And do you think actually it can be done well? And for me, that sort of was the, the, the starting point, what I'd like to talk about today, what exactly I believe uh, or how exactly I think um, gamification, applying game design in non-game context can be done right, so to speak. Um, I'd like to do that basically in three little steps. Um, first off, for those of you who are not familiar with the topic, I'd just like to jump through a quick introduction. What is gamification? What do we mean by that term? And then basically, for the majority of the talk, talk about three essential things that I think in the current discourse and in the current applications that I see are most definitely missing, and how to address those missing ingredients, so to speak. And in the remainder of the talk, I'd then like to um, say, well, fine, what does that mean for user experience designers, for product managers in practice? How to translate that into your own job practice? Um, so let's start right off with gamification. And I'd like to start really with, with three little stories, because um, in my mind or in my opinion, all of us are basically game designers or gamification designers, at least in our childhood. Now, this is not me, but this is basically how my, uh, walk, how my walk home from school usually looked like. It was a very boring, dready walk. So what I did to make that walk less um, less tedious. I sort of looked at the cracks in the pavement. I imagined, well, let's say I'm not just a, you know, a boy walking home to school, but let's imagine I'm a, um, a research scientist and I have my cover suit on, and this here is really a volcano. And out of these little cracks in the pavement, there is hot lava coming. And I basically made a game out of it by deciding, okay, I imagine there is lava, and I do not, I, I should not step on the little cracks in the pavement, which turned that very boring walk home less boring and more exciting for me. Um, second story, which, which some of you might also have, uh, have a memory of in their childhood, my parents had a pretty big lawn in the backyard of our house, and it fell to me to, to mow the lawn. And usually, because it was so big, it was a very daunting task. So to make that daunting task less daunting to me, what I did basically was that I would slice up in my mind that lawn into smaller chunks. And I would say, OK, this is the whole lawn, but I'm going to do the third first, and that one I'm going to do in long rows. And then I'll do the second third, and that I'm going to do in short rows, and so on. Splicing the whole thing up into smaller achievable goals so that the whole experience got less daunting to me. Um, and the third example I'd like to give is just the, the, the playground, the sandbox that we had back in our house where our parents would usually let us play or let me and my friends play. And what they were thinking it was that basically what we would do there, play in the sand, play little sand castles. But the great thing about the experience for us that we were left alone to our own mischief. So what we usually end up doing was doing all kinds of weird stuff with Lego or Playmobil things. The real enjoyment there for us was exactly the fact that our parents were not observing us. It was a free space to play around, to toy around with stuff. And I think, as I said, in these three little stories, there are already a lot of principles that game and game design put to good use to make an experience more engaging and more fun. Um, like 
having a make-believe story wrapped around an experience or adding rules and challenges to make it more interesting, setting goals and having feedback, like looking in the lawn and saying, oh yeah, I already made three lines, or having a free space, play, free uh, place to toy around with other people. So let's move on to today's software world. Um, as you may have or may have not heard, that is sort of the world, although many people don't like the word, that is sort of the word that people have agreed on, gamification, describing can we not use elements out of games, elements out of video games, use them in non-entertainment software to make them more motivating, more engaging um, to the users. Just a quick couple of examples. Uh, in fitness, of course, there is Nike Plus, which you basically see at every second UX conference now thrown around, and it's also an example thrown around for how to add points and challenges and competition to the experience of just jogging. It becomes more encouraging and engaging. Uh, one of my personal favorite, Health Month by Buster Benson, um, which is basically a game where you set for one month rules for your own health behavior, like drink no alcohol or something like that, and you earn points and badges based on whether you make it or you don't make it. Um, Mint.com, always an example that people um, often give where you set yourself financial goals like get out of debt or save up for a holiday and then again it gives you feedback on how, how good you make on those goals. Um, sustainability, Nissan MyLeaf just came out with the Nissan MyLeaf challenge where you basically try to beat others in taking a certain road more efficiently um, um, than your competitors so to speak. Um, Entertainment, um, this is one of the examples that was just up in the uh, Gamification Summit in San Francisco this Thursday. A club site, basically a, a website around a TV show where with challenges, with mini games, with point earns for doing stuff on the website, um, people were trying to bring in more and to engage more with the brand. Um, shopping, there's stuff like Barcode Hero or so where you earn points for checking into shops or or, or writing reviews for, um, uh, for products. And finally, more close to home, even stuff like debugging that is try to be um, turned into a game like Play Nicely where you earn badges and points for depending on how many and how well you, uh, you submit bugs. Um, and to round it all off, um, in the past year, uh, quite a couple of service vendors have popped up that sort of try to offer a service platform or a kind of turnkey, turnkey solution to, um, to add game design or to add game design elements to your website. Now, if you zoom out a little and if you look at all this from a little bit more afar, you'll notice that the blueprint that all of them are still thinking about or that really still sets the scope of what is meant with gamification was the initial Foursquare. Basically, you have an activity that you want your users to do more often. Thus, you, you uh, give points for the users if the user does that activity. Um, then you have some sort of goals or badges or trophies that the user wins for a certain amount of points or for a certain kind of activity. And then you have some sort of leaderboards to add an element of competition in all of that. And the whole discourse is pretty much split between the one side, um, um, like Scavenger uh, startup here, uh, where they basically think, well, gamification is the future of user experience design in general, and it's basically pure mind control. We can do users, we can make users do anything with this kind of stuff. And mostly game designers, on the other hand, um, where you see a big backlash and they say, well, this is really, as Margaret Robertson from the UK says, an inadvertent con. This is trying to sell you that there is an easy way and slap on way um, to make something as motivating, as engaging, as a well-designed game with just some niddly bits there. Um, so the question that I'd like to take you through the day today, is there something as a secret ingredient that current gamification designers miss out or is that some sort of snake oil 2.0 talking? And as I said in the beginning, I think there are three missing ingredients right now that we have to take care of, really. Um, the first one, um, going back to my first story, meaning how to make the experience, the activity, connect to the user in a meaningful fashion, to his interests, to his passions, to his goals. The second thing, and that connects to me to the story about the lawnmower, is mastery. How to craft an experience in such a way that the user gets the sense of progressing towards his or her goals, of achieving something, of feeling competent. 
And finally, that is the playground autonomy, a sense of freedom, a sense of um, being left alone to your own mischief, a sense of being able to curiously explore opportunities without necessarily any kind of functional outcome attached to what you're doing there. So let me start off with the first one, with meaning. Um, this blog post by Arsenio Santos um, voices a pretty common observation among uh, many, many Foursquare users right now, where he says why he quit playing Foursquare. And basically what he is saying, over time I began to notice that the achievements wound up being almost the only benefit for using the service. And that is why he quit playing Foursquare. Translated, because Foursquare underneath the game mechanics didn't provide anything of value or interest to him, um, it is a very shallow effect of novelty. You play around with it, you discover some stuff, and then suddenly you notice there's, there's nothing really there for me. Um, contrast that with Stack Overflow, right? Which is again a poster child for having reputation, having points, having badges for the user. But even if you would take all of that away from that question and answer platform, it would still be immensely valuable, meaningful, helpful to the user using this platform on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, to translate that into a sort of more practical recommendations or gambits, as I call them, um, I'd like to start off with one observation that Aaron Patzer, the founder from Mint.com, recently made, where he said, well, all of the game mechanics that we were using on the site, all the points that we're using, all the progress bars and so on, they were basically meaningless to the user unless they were connected to a personal goal that the user, him or herself, brought to the platform. So that, as a sort of first recommendation, tried to hark into or try to offer the user the opportunity to bring their personal goals to the platform. In the case of Mint.com, that is very obvious, right? You get the opportunity to say, well, this is my financial goal to you to get out of debt or to buy a home or whatever. Uh, speaking more generally, the recommendation there is to ensure that you have customizable goals, goals that the user himself can input into the system and say the system, now help me with all those mechanics achieving my own goals. Now, it needn't necessarily be personal goals to, uh, that, that you bring to the platform. Um, to make the goals or to make the system itself meaningful to the user, it, it is enough that it connects at some way, in some way, to an interest or a passion or a curiosity of the user that he already has in his everyday life. Um, that can be pro-social goals, like, for instance, an interest in science or, or, or general care of science, and you're not a scientist yourself. But then when you come to one of the many, many crowdsourced platforms that offer you to play a minigame and the data that comes out of that minigame is then as in Folded or here in Philo uh, where it is about matching DNA sequences. The data that you produce there is then used in actual, in, in actual scientific number crunching. That connects to your interest and your passion as a user if you have it uh, for science and therefore becomes a meaningful activity to you. The second large way of ensuring that the system is meaningful to the user is to ensure that you're connecting to a, to a meaningful community of interest. Um, I'm putting up bragging rights here because many of the gamification vendors say that the core motivator that they use or that they believe they are tapping into is status and reputation, showing off bragging in front of your friends. Now, to show off and to brag in, in front of your fence, you better do that with something that is actually an achievement and that is actually something um, that your friends would care about. So to give you a negative example, um, the entertainment recommendation site getclue.com um, allows you to sort of check in and like different items of pop entertainment and then earn badges for that. Now, since I'm not that much into pop entertainment, uh, to earn a... Uh, um, I don't know, I'm a movie buff because I liked 50 movies batch, isn't really that relevant or interesting or meaningful to me, nor is it something that I would go around to my friends and saying, hey, I earned that badge, you know? That's something that slips out as an autopost and I say, oh, sheesh, I'm, I'm rather ashamed of that. Um, Whereas if you contrast that with a, with a more um, focused community like BoardGameGeek.com, which is basically a huge wiki and community site for board games. Now, as many of my friends are board game geeks, and as I myself like board games very much, um, if er I earn one of those micro badges on the site, like I am a Hornet Leader 2 fan, or I am the moderator of, um, of, of say, the Axis and Alice page. That is something meaningful to me. That is something meaningful to the community around there. And if they give me a kudos or a thumbs up uh, or so, that is actually something that I care about, that delivers reputation I'm interested in. Um, the 
again, a more practical way that BoardGameGeek.com achieves that, that just like the um, customizable goal, they offer community-generated goals and community-generated badges that the community itself can create with the art, with the kinds of activities you have to do to achieve them, and so on and so on. Thus automatically ensuring that the community itself cares about these kinds of items. Now you might say, well, usually with video games, it is the case that um, they don't really connect very much to anything in our everyday life or any everyday relevancy. How is it that video games achieve that kind of meaning to the activity that you use? And the trick that video games usually do is they enwrap the whole thing in a story, and usually they don't make it under only you can save mankind. That's sort of 90% of the standard video game stories. The big story arc, save the princess, save mankind, whatever. And that kind of overarching narrative gives meaning to all the goals, all the levels, all the activities in between, connecting them to something meaningful on the long end. Um, take a game classic like Missile Command, back in the 1980s by Atari. Um, I could describe this game for you, or this game screen of, for you, without using any element of story. I could say, well, you know, the point in this game is basically that you see these little green dots there going down, and, and you yourself shoot, shoot other green little dots up on the blue line, and they explode at a certain point, and your point is to keep red from reaching blue down below. Not very engaging, not very fun. Now, if you unwrap that kind of abstract mechanic in the story that Missile Command tells, only you can save mankind, or in this case, defend your city from nuclear bombs, that becomes a more comprehensible as well as a much more engaging activity. <laughs> to translate that into, into reality, we have a huge amount of crowdsourcing efforts, especially in the, in the whole transparency movement, right? Where people, as here on WashingtonWatch.com, are regularly asked, you know, file something you know about your representative, file earmarks or whatever. If you present that just as that kind of activity, it's, it's kind of boring. You have to be a real policy buff to care about this. However, if you're able to narratively frame the whole thing more in a citizen journalist, the untouchables, and corruption, or discover corruption in your quarter, that becomes more interesting. And you understand why the little earmark that you file is actually a meaningful activity. Um, one practical way to do that is to ensure that you have supporting visuals and copy for exactly that story that you wrap around the activity. Um, that support you and that cue you into that kind of story or theme or fictional world around it. Um, just to give you an example, imagine Mafia Wars, the hugely popular Facebook game, um, would be devoid of all kinds of copy or visuals that would relate in any way to, uh, uh, to the world of Mafia. Then it would become a very abstract and, quite frankly, very boring game of fill up the progress bars. Um, so, Take care that the visual carries the story that you have there. Now, in terms of meaning, there is always a danger involved. And the danger in terms of meaning is that the activity that you do on a platform obviously has broader meanings in the social context of everyday life. Um, the, 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 the story I always tell to this is this platform, Akoha, which basically tries to engage people in doing uh, sort of random acts of kindness in their everyday life by turning those into missions, like treat a friend to your favorite dessert, and then you earn points for completing these missions. Well, a friend game designer of mine did that with another friend of his, treated him to a dessert. The other got curious and asked, well, why did you do that? He pulled out his iPhone and said, well, you know, I'm just playing this nice little Akoha game here, which told me to treat you to a dessert. To which the other friend quite angrily replied, have you any idea how degrading that is? That you treat me to a dessert not while you care about me, but because you want to win some shitty game? Um, so the recommendation I would give there to you, if you're building such a system, do test it in real life with your own real life friends to see if anything there feels awkward. And if it feels awkward to you or your friends, and especially your non-geeky friends, chances are it will also be the case for your users. Um, this is another nice example that they found with Frontier World where you can design your own spouse once you made it to your spouse. And uh, one of the game designer actually did that and, and designed his own spouse. And then uh, the, the senior uh, game designer was called by his wife asking, say, tell me, did he on purpose design that kind of spouse for himself, uh, or did he hit the random button and that was the random spouse that he got? Um, these kinds of awkwardnesses, these kinds of meanings in a larger context is something that you have to take care of. 
So to quickly recap that point, you have to connect to personal goals and interests and passions. You have to connect to a meaningful community of interest around the activity you're designing for. You have to wrap it in a visually supported stories, and you have to be aware of those kind of social context meanings. Now, moving on to the second thing, to mastery. Um, one thing I, I don't tire of saying or I don't tire of arguing against is sort of a fundamental misconception, I believe, in the gamification discourse about why video games are motivating and engaging. And if you look at their kind of copy and their, their materials on the website where they say, why is this engaging to your user, they say, well, because of rewards. We deal out rewards. We incentivize behavior. That's how video games work. So basically, their idea is a kind of pop behaviorist idea um, of video games as a kind of Skinner box, where every time you hit the right lever, you get a little sugar palette as a rat. And, and, and they then usually liken that to World of Warcraft and say, you know, if you kill enough creatures, then some loot pops out, and that's sort of the Skinner box there. Uh, but if that would be the case, then this should be the funnest game ever, earning you a whopping trillion points or a whopping trillion rewards or whatever every time you hit the button. Um, luckily, Jakob Stjerning actually built that thing. He called it Progress Wars. Um, just to make a point, and there are lots of these games just to make a point, like Achievement Unlocked or so. And if you play this kind of game and watch the lovely progress, war, uh, progress bar progress for a couple of times, you notice it's not really a very engaging activity. Not really rewarding. It's just like Mafia was, exactly. Um, so why is it that video games are motivating then? And to me, still, the one sentence that sums it up most nicely is by game designer Rev Coaster, fun is just another word for learning. That might sound counterintuitive because usually learning we associate with school and school we not necessarily associate with fun. Um, but let's, let's look more deeply what he means with that. What he means with that is that um, the fun in games, the fun in learning is the fun of mastering something, the fun of figuring out a puzzle, recognizing a pattern, having developed the dexterity to make that next step in the game you, that you couldn't make before. And the good sense of achievement that you get when you finally master that, that is the core fun that video games, um, that video games give us. It is between the tension of, Will I make this, clenching my tongue in my mouth? And then the final resolution, if I make it. That is the core fun of video games. Um, but then going back to school, you might ask, well, uh, school also you know, poses us challenges, like solving mathematical equations. Why is that not fun? And why is playing Magic the Gathering, which, if played well, also requires a whole lot of mathematics to understand the cards and the strategies? Uh, why is that then a fun activity? And I think that is one thing we have to add to the sentence of Rev Coaster. Fun is just another word for learning under optimal conditions. And what witty games provide us are optimal conditions for these kinds of learning of mastery experiences. And the core way they do this is that they design interesting challenges for us. If you look at most of the current gamification vendors, the challenge that posed to you is like, read five blog posts or uh, uh, fill out this little questionnaire, or, or check in twice to our website, which is not really an interesting challenge. It's just as blonde as leaving the house. Um, games create interesting challenges, taking the example of golf, by setting you a goal, first of all. Right? In golf, the goal is very obvious. You have to put that little ball into that little hole. Now, if that would be everything, the game of golf would be very boring, because you could just take the ball, walk over to the hole, it in. There you go. Um, so what games do to make that interesting is they add some rules. There are certain ways in which you may and may not achieve those goals. And the rule is you have to hit it with this weird stick, and you may not just start everywhere. You have to start at this point, um, and you have to play the ball from wherever it ends up. And that, together, creates all of the interesting challenges of golf when you're in a sand hole um, or when you're way off park and so on. That is what creates the interesting challenges of any game. Trying to break that down into a, a, a few more concrete recommendations there. The one is to actually have clear, visually present goals in your interface. This is something that GetGlue actually does quite well, because it welcomes the user usually with some, si with, with some kind of invitation saying, hey, you're returning. Um, here's the next achievable goal for you um, to make progress, so to speak, in our game. Um, 
But then it, games usually do not just present us goals, they also take care that the goals that they set are well-structured, well-ordered. Think of the lawn mowing example. Just setting me the goal, you know, mow the lawn is a daunting task. But if you chunk it up into medium and small term goals so that whenever I enter the game, I have a small, doable, achievable goal right in front of me. And the game ensures that whenever I finish that, there is right next to the goal for me to reach afterwards, which is just in grasp. That pulls me through the game experience. Um, a good example for that is the introduced missions in uh, Frontier Will and now in City Will, um, where if you enter the game, you can play it without any kind of missions or goals, but when you open it, on the left-hand side, you see a list of missions that you can achieve. And if you then click on these missions, you see again that they're structured just in the way that I described, right? You have the long-term goal, or medium-term goal, build a bakery, which is again chopped up into other smaller, even more achievable tasks or goals for you. So, the next thing, or the next take, the next twist on that structured flow of goals is to ensure that it is just not a bland line of goals which are just on the same level, but that they get increasingly more difficult. My uh, most beloved example for that is when Twitter recently uh, crowdsourced their translation. And you could earn points for entering translations for the different uh, pieces of the interface, and then you could level, it, level up by, um, by those points. And if you look at the bar, the progress bar, then you can nicely see that from each level to each level, the number of points you would need to level up gets increasingly more. It gets increasingly more difficult to reach the next level, the next goal. And that actually blends nicely with one of the core psychological theories around why play or games are fun, which is Mihai Chicks and Mihai's flow theory, where he basically says, usually we feel best not if we're under challenged, then we're bored nor when we're over-challenged, then we're frustrated and anxious. But in that ideal middle spot where we're neither over nor under-challenged, where the challenges match our abilities, and thus we get a feeling of achievement by actually mastering them. Um, now, games usually don't pull such a very straight line through there if you look at the difficulty curves of games. What they do is they rather have a kind of flickery line where you have a very steep challenge and then suddenly something that is very low and it just moves on slowly there to keep pace with your growing ability to keep it interesting, but they have this fluctuation in there. And the reason for that is that this on the one hand provides you experiences of failure, right? Damn, I didn't manage that level, which gives you something to learn from. Hmm, why didn't I do that? Let's try something else this time. Um, as well as valuing when you finally make it, right? When you fail three times and then you succeed the fourth time, the success, the success feels much more, uh, much more rewarding than when you uh, succeeded the first time. And then they keep the difficulty low after that for a certain time to give you the experience of acing out, of absolutely being the super king, um, finishing everything, and then rising the difficulty again for you. And again, you're struggling there a bit. Um, so games have this kind of fluctuating pacing of difficulty, but not only that, they take care that the kinds of difficulty they pose to you are not just more of the same, right? Um, you earn a badge for liking 50 movies. Now let's see if you can earn a Now let's see if you can like 100 movies or 250 movies. That's not fun, that's boring, that's grinding, that's repetitive. What games do if you take, say, Super Mario is they let you, they pose you one kind of challenge. Let's see if you can make all that jumping. Then another. Let's see when you, whether you can make all that shooting other creatures with fireballs or so, and then combine that to a more complex challenge. Let's see whether you can jump and fire at the same time. So they vary the challenges as well as increasing them in complexity and not just in quantity. Um, so translated into a platform that would mean not just present me, oh, even more movies to like, even more movies to like, have other activities in the platform like engage in that quiz or whatever, and then try to scaffold that slowly to more interesting complex tasks like become the moderator of a page. The final way, and for many people maybe the most obvious way in which video games give us these experiences of mastery is by providing us with excessive positive feedback if we are able to master something. Um, my favorite example for this is the uh, PopCap game Peggle, where if you look at the screen, you see the little metal ball, and your point is to shoot all the orange balls down there in the, in the uh, 
room below, and I already shoot all of them apart from the last one. Let's see what happens if I shoot the last orange ball. That's what game designers call juicy feedback. And that's one way of providing you these experiences of mastery, sort of underlining that you really made it. Um, um, take for just a simple example, this is Ribbon Hero, sort of the tutorial game uh, um, done by Microsoft, where for the achievement of clearing formatting, you get this big fat batch saying, congratulations, you cleared formatting. Um, <laughs> could be a real challenge, depending. Um, so those are the ways to make a challenge interesting, to give you an experience of mastery. But again, in setting up these kinds of rule system with points and goals and challenges, there is a danger. And the danger involved there is the kind of emergent behavior that it can give rise to, all kinds of cheating or exploiting or similar things in your software. Um, this is a good example. Tumblr put up this, this dashboard for users of Tumblr back in the May 2009 where you have this score, this Tumblrity score, which was the overall score for your popularity on the Tumblr platform. Now, it turned out the easiest way to drive that score up was just to post incessantly, irregardless of what you were posting, because for every post, you would get a point. Uh, what that led to was that Tumblr, which was previously very much as a community about hand-picking and curating interesting stuff found in the internet, in a sort of incessant dribble, and the community backlashed immensely against this with all of these kinds. You know, just add Tumblrity into a, into a Google image search, and then you find all the ways in which the Tumblr community said, we don't want that. Um, so Tumblr finally, in January 2010, took down the Tumblrity score and replaced it with a directory because they found, yeah, it is encouraging, but it is not encouraging for the kind of behavior that we actually want to encourage. Another good example is all the kinds of applications like MajorMaker and so on out there for Foursquare, which help you to auto-check in and onto all places where you just drive by, um, thus voiding the actual competition that you have for who gets to be the major at a certain place, because the device does that automatically for you. Um, at the Playful Conference in London, where I was, they actually had a kind of voting by the foot by people of the Foursquare community there asking whether this would be deemed illegal or not in London. I don't know if whether everyone sticks to that. But again, you see that you create this kind of unintended emergent behavior, very likely if you set up these kinds of systems. The recommendation I would give there to you is when you playtest your systems, try to game it yourself. Give your playtesters the task, game this system in any which way possible so that we figure out whether there is this kind of unintended emergent behavior hidden in our system. To wrap that up again, uh, what you should do then is provide interesting challenges to create experiences of mastery, clear goals which are scaffolded, paced, and varied, provide juicy feedback, and beware of that kind of gaming the system or exploiting the system behavior that will eventually appear if you create anything that is worthwhile. Now I come to my last point, autonomy. Um, the freedom, the play space in the backyard that allows me to be involved in my own mischief there with my Lego and Playmobil figures. Um, and this is something I believe very important for especially productivity contexts. Um, because one of the core elements of play and games, and one of the core things that makes them motivating, according to a lot of research, is that they are, by definition, a voluntary activity, an activity that we chose for ourselves. And um, the most often told story there is obviously the story about Tom Sawyer managing to, to convince his friends to paint the fence for him and even pay him money for the privilege of painting the fence for him. How did Tom Sawyer do that? Well, the friends walked by him. He had to paint the fence. He was asked by his, by his aunt to do that. And when the friends were kind of mocking him, he said, no, no, you go fishing. I'd rather paint the fence. And then they got curious and saying, you're mocking us. No, no, you go ahead. Well, can we paint the fence? Maybe just try it? No, no, you go ahead, I'll paint the fence. And he was, try he was able to create the impression in them that he was painting the fence voluntarily. And that made the experiential difference there, which Mark Twain himself very concisely put, um, as he said, if Tom had been a great and wise philosopher, um, he would have comprehended that work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do and play of whatever a body is not obliged to do. 
Just to give you a concrete example, one and the same activity like filling out spreadsheets can be very dreadful if you do them at work. However, if you do them in an online multiplayer game like, like um, EVE Online in this case, where very much you're doing precisely the same activity, you're even paying for the privilege of doing that activity in the game because you voluntarily chose to play that game in the point and you were not asked by someone else, go fill out that spreadsheet. The point why I'm talking about this uh, in, in, in relation to productivity context, in relation to, um, um, to gamification specifically, is because this core element of autonomy is easily damaged if you slap some extrinsic reward on an activity, a cash incentive, a punishment, a quarterly evaluation, whatever. Um, the one thing that we find in research, if you do that, if you add an if-then reward to a specific activity, you curb the felt autonomy of the person. The person says, ooh, I didn't choose to do that. Someone else helped me do that. And then I feel less in control of myself, which is usually a very demotivating experience. Um, like here, the, the scoreboard application just came out for salesforce.com, right? Depending on whether that is just an innocuous scoreboard or whether you're a supervisor actually attach some monetary value or some quarterly evaluation to the outcome on the scoreboard, it can be empowering or it can be very demotivating. Um, the second problem with that is that you're basically devaluing the activity if you attach some extrinsic reward to it, right? If you say, please buy me 1,000 Twitter followers or please buy me 1,000 Facebook followers, if I know about that, the fact that you now have 1,000 Twitter followers more doesn't improve the value of your service, it devalues it because I know, well, they had to pay for that, right? It's so bad they even have to pay to get their own followers. Likely, if you have something as a sweepstake and you say, please retweet this link to our service to enter the sweepstake, the social signal that gets sent along with that is, well, you know, their service is so bad they actually have to come up with a sweepstake um, to promote it. People would not voluntarily, autonomously retweet it to their friends. So how to deal with that? The first solution done by uh, Cubeless.com, a little a knowledge management platform, is that in their platform, they're using it for travel agents, um, they have no strings attached. It's a question and answer platform, some game mechanics in there. Basically, you get to customize your profile more, you, the more active you are on the platform. But that relates in no way to any other performance metric in the company. It's just what you do on the platform, no strings attached. A second way which is done beautifully in the, in the whole customer service thing in Zappos, which I hope you're not uh, already fed up with hearing about, is to set up a shared goal with shared values and intentions behind that. We want a good customer experience, make the customer happy. But how you do that, completely up to you. Give the user many possible ways to achieve a goal once you, are, once you agreed on the goal. That increases the experience of autonomy that you say, okay, Great, I agreed to, to do that goal together with you and now I get to choose how to do it. The third way of doing that is to provide feedback that is informational, helpful in solving the task versus information that is a pat on the back and say, now that you did it, here's a reward or now that you didn't do it, you don't get the Snickers bar. Um, like in that case, again, uh, mint.com where they give you helpful feedback on how far you are in reaching your goal and next steps to do if you, if you don't make it. Informational rather than controlling feedback. And the finally way to do that, unexpected rewards, right? Easter eggs, as they are called in video games. If you don't expect a certain reward and suddenly in the interface there is something popping at you saying congratulations, you don't make a causal relation in your head between you doing the activity and the reward, hence you don't feel controlled by it, hence you feel autonomous. To recap that up again for you, play is by definition a voluntary activity and beware of curbing the autonomy of your users, beware of curbing that voluntariness with what you do, like extrinsic rewards, or beware of devaluing your product with that. Be very careful about the social signals you're sending out with these kinds of things. To package it finally for you, what does that mean in practice for you as a user experience designer or product manager? How do I go about designing a gamified service if I took care of all of that? Well. The first thing 
is think process not features, think design process not features. All the service vendors basically give you this nice list of features that they offer as a turnkey solution. But um, just as you will know from the, from the early web 2.0 days, right, whether a service took off or it didn't take off was not about having a tag cloud or not having a tag cloud. It was about all the niddly fiddly design details, about designing the features that you offered, um, the user interface, so that it really met the audience you were designing for, and that you only get out of a process, not out of a feature. The first way there is just read the rules, understand core parts of game design. Now, there are some books you can read, books like the Game Design Workshop, which I very much recommend, but the easiest way to do that basically is to start playing board games. If you play board games and afterwards just discuss and reflect on how did that board game create a dynamic of competition between us or a dynamic of collaboration between us or how did it make that end game so dramatic, you have a very easy way of studying and of tweaking the rules in a board game to understand how the rules create that kind of interesting challenge or not. The second thing, and that also is obvious for any good user experience designers is know your users. Understand that you are not necessarily the target audience. Understand what kinds of play, what kinds of games, what kinds of motivations, um, what kinds of play they like, what kinds of motivations they bring. Just a quick example, the platform fanlib.com um, was a platform that tried to collect fan fiction throughout the net. Uh, fiction brought by, by, by fans about Star Trek or Star Wars or Harry Potter or so. And the way they did it with these kinds of nice advertising is, well, we offer sweepstakes and competitions. Who is the best fan fiction writer? And the page completely went under. Reason you can likely see from the actual advertisement, turns out the audience is 99% female. And turns out fan fiction writing is very much about collaboration, expression, mutual help and not any kind of competition. So it was a game mechanic, but it was the completely wrong game mechanic for the audience they were designing for. Finally, and again, you will know that as a user experience designer, the only way to get fun right is to build a prototype, a paper prototype of the rule system or point system as early as possible, play test it and iterate on what you find. That is essentially the core of game design. If you look at the best-selling casual game of 2009, Plants vs. Zombies, with more than 15 million downloads, and if you look in the design history, there's a nice presentation in SlideShare, of which the link I will have in my own slides at the end. Um, what they basically did, that from the first sketch up until the final polished product, they went through three years of iterating on the product. Not full-time, but three years of iteration. I don't say you need to do three years of iteration. I'm saying if you want a game that is as fun and as addictive as Plants vs. Zombies, there is no way around prototyping, playtesting, and iterating. Not only over qualitative feedback, but also, my last point, over quantitative feedback. That has been, as in usability, has been one of the major steps forward in game design in the last years, that they have started to bring in massive amounts of data over user data like how many seconds did it take to win that level and then finding out, okay, that level is too easy, that level is too hard. Or all the kinds of data that social games now bring in with monthly active users or, or daily active users or the ratio between. All kinds of data to understand questions like, have we curbed exploits? Is that point system fine balanced? Or is that point system something that encourages the wrong kinds of behavior? Um, have we set the right challenges, or is that challenge too boring, too hard, or too easy for the people? So, finally, wrapping up in summary, if you want to design for something that is meaningful, for meaningful play for your users, instead of some kind of shallow progress wars, you have to provide a story or any kind of meaning that connects to the user's everyday life a rule system that they can master, and a free space that they can play in. You have to be mindful of the kind of side effects you can create with the rule systems and the social context of those activities. You have to learn the basic ropes of rule design, and finally, just be a good user experience designer. Thank you. How are we for time? Yeah, sure. Questions if there are some. So one of the things I've noticed about many games is the score has one or two or three zeros at the bottom. Yeah. And I always feel I'm being patronized when I see that. <laughs> and yet you seem 
that advocate excessive reinforcement? Um, there is one thing about earning one point versus earning 100 points of something, usually in the terms of, of, of the core currency that you run around in your mind. So, so you know, what, what kind of currency that you run around with, you know, one that's not so much, 100 that's a little more. If you live in a country with a hugely inflated currency, there's sort of another sense. Um, it gives something if the point amount is bigger, but again, you have to make sure that uh, people get the relations between the different activities right, and they just don't get lost and say, now was this uh, twice as good or twice as successful as the other thing, in just inflated numbers. Um, and then there is a little value there in just having juicy feedback, as I said, and just, in, in just being very gratuitous in, 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 in giving feedback. But then again, be sure that the user understands the relations between the different activities that you're measuring there. I see. So, the, yeah, sure. So the question was: Is there a potential conflict of interest between sort of the uh, the designer of the product that wants you to to basically click more, be be longer on the page, and the user who actually wants a meaningful experience? Um, yes, there can be. There can also be a conflict of interest, say, between the user just wanting to be very efficient and get away and get done with it, and the site wanting to keep you there longer on the site, for instance. Um, Ultimately, as far as my thinking goes, if you're not able to connect to something that the user himself is intrinsically interested in or motivated by, um, you, you get a shallow novelty effect there. So the user is just curious, figuring that out. Then it goes away, and then there is no value in the game mechanics. So if you're, if you're not able to sort of hook into the user's personal goals and motivations there, um, um, you're, you're likely not going to be very successful. One way of doing that would be something that Louis von Arndt calls games with a purpose. So you build a full-fledged game and just use the data that the game generates for your purposes as a site. So say he uses this for image tagging, right? The game is about you trying to guess which word comes first to mind to another anonymous player. But in reality, the words you're typing in, trying to guess what the words is, um, is used as image tags. Google Image Label basically uses that. Um, that is one way when you find that there is no way in which the user's motivations and interests align with the interests of the site. More questions? I see. So the, qu the question, as, as far as I understood it, the relation between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, and one of the people, uh, I think it was um, Rajat Paharia, as well as um, from Bunchball, as well as the guy from USA Networks, who talked about this at the US Networks, where they say, once we entered the sweepstakes into the whole gamified system we had, then we actually saw user uptake. Before that, we didn't saw user uptake. We actually added extrinsic rewards. Um, so the relation between their I think it very much comes down to how the user themselves end up framing the experience, whether they feel that the extrinsic motivator is some, is, is some nice given, but something optional for them, and they say, oh, yeah, why, why not, right? I don't feel controlled by that. And how you frame that experience, I believe, is, is ultimately um, the question. So if it's an entertainment site and you don't really care about it in the first place and it doesn't really... Um, relate to you in your first place doesn't have any harsh consequences if you lose or win in that. Then to add another little sweepstake there, um, you, 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 then just basically um, buying into people's motivation um, of getting something for free, which is also a motivator. But that doesn't curb that kind of autonomy. I'm more concerned there with actual productivity work contexts, where I believe that is more of a threat.
Great. And thank you so much. And as you can see, um, slides will be up uh, together with lots of linky goodness um, during this week. Thanks.